is currently some seeming tension in the National Democratic Congress on who will lead the party in the general elections in 2020. Several names have come up and Sylvester Mensah is one of them. After a failed attempt to become the party general secretary in 2005, he has now set his eyes on a much higher position, the presidency. Does he stand a realistic chance of becoming the flag bearer of the National Democratic Congress for the 2020 general elections, or this would be just another attempt in futility? How does he intend to market himself to the delegates? To discuss even more, I have with me Mr. Sylvester Minza, former Chief Executive Officer of the National Health Insurance Authority and former MP for La Dadekutupon constituency. And my name is Nana Akosia Kunidra Santi Samuels, and you are watching The Hard Truth. We are proudly brought to you by Murphy Homes and Dawa Industrial City. Former Chief Executive Officer of uh, National Health Insurance Authority, uh, Sylvester Mensa, is here. Welcome to The Hard Truth, sir. My pleasure. Confess. How many times have I called you for an interview? Let's, Honestly. Let's let Ghana know Honestly. what you've put me through for just an hour of your time. I guess it's been three years now, or even more. Yes. And uh, perhaps you've been calling when... No, Sylvester, we started this journey together. What is important is that I am here. No, but, but so what do you have to do? Compensation by doing what? Apolo so, so, ap apologies. And then... And then I have come. And then, making an in future, when I call you, you I come. I will come. <laughs> <laughs> it's good to see you, sir. Mm -hmm. Good to see good you. To you see look you so too. well. Great. Going straight to business, your autobiography um, titled In the Sh uh, Shadows of Politics, which was, I think, published in 2013, generated speculations of your intent to lead the NDC uh, in the foreseeable future, as it is, or as it stands now. You have made your ambition, uh, you know, public. At what point in your political career, sir, did you develop the appetite uh, to lead the NDC? Well, let me say that publishing a book was not a direct response to an ambition. It was after reading President John Dramani Mohammed's book, My First My Coup d'Etat, mm. that I generated, or that generated the motivation to also script something. And uh, it was entirely uh, uh, not pregnant in any way. Mm. And it was simply to put across one's experiences for others, particularly the youth, to take a cue from and uh, to know that life always begins in a very humble way and that it takes a conscious human effort to direct one's destiny and that whatever you purpose in life is achievable. Fifty, your life wasn't over, you articulated some things that happened to you. Um, so yes, again, um, you would tell me you didn't think of it, you didn't plan it, but didn't it just dawn on you that I could be the next leader of the NDC, or I could be the next leader of, of, of the, the, the whole country? Well, when you enter politics, unless you enter with no capacity, no talent, but if you have capacity, you have talent, and you enter politics, I think that you don't throw away opportunities when they come. Mm. And no opportunity is too big. To that extent, yes, you know, when, when one is recruited into the military as an officer corps, mm. one of the key advice is aim to be the chief of defense staff. But don't shoot the current chief of defense staff as a way of occupying that seat. And that seat is occupied by only one person. And several people are recruited. So you say you eyed cadet. from a distance. So when you, you eyed, enter, so you enter. So are you saying that from a distance you eyed the presidency? I mean, you you mentioned about, you're talking about the military and then you not shoot, but in your heart of heart you knew that someday I would want to occupy that seat. Well, it's been on my mind that well, one day, if uh, it's the will of God, 
that I rise to that position, why not? And uh, I think that every politician would think along the same line. But right. so not a, a, around which time in your life, or at this point in your life, did you feel that I think it's time? I guess I started hearing a lot of uh, discussions and conversations around leadership in the future, mm -hmm. and in particular leadership after President John Mahama within the NDC. Mm -hmm. And I noticed that my name always featured in the discussions. So I began some introspection, I began some soul searching, and uh, began to eavesdrop into some of the discussions and the considerations, and in particular why my name mm -hmm. appeared to be featuring in most of the discussions, mm -hmm. and realized that, of course, why not? If that appears to be a conversation that is gaining currency, then I must as well get prepared for it. But and clearly there are other equally qualified or the other people more qualified than, than you can as well lead uh, the NDC in between 2020. What makes you believe that there is so you are the right person for the job? Well, I guess that our party has got into a junction. At which junction we have so much disaffection, disunity, anger, frustration, and expectations. This point, or this point in our history, is completely different from all the destinations we have got into as a political party. And every epoch, every situation, requires a completely new set of, of strategies. But in this particular context, we have gotten to a point where our party requires a new breath of life. Our party requires a new set of vision, a new face, a new talent, a new set of relationships, and an approach that will galvanize the youth of our party, the mass of our party, generate a new set of enthusiasm and momentum in our party membership so, so I, I, towards I, I, right. our future. And the future of every political party is to snatch political power and to lead the country, providing what the country needs to grow. Let's go back a little bit. I mean, uh, uh, to um, before this election, before 2016. Let's look at uh, former President Mahama. What do you think? Do you think or do you believe he was a good leader for, for your party then? I guess at the time he burst into the political scene. He was the best for our party and for this country, mm. and he played his role. We have got into a completely new era that requires a completely new set Was he a competent approaches. president? Of course. Know? I mean, uh, uh, the Ghanaians would always elect a competent person. He was competent, and uh, he dealt with the challenges of his time. Mm. And uh, at the time, infrastructure was one of our key demands, and uh, I think he lived up to expectation. There's no government in this country that compares as far as our infrastructure development. You, you are just said that we need a leader to breathe fresh air. What does it mean to breathe that freshness? Of course, you would appreciate that we lost an election. You would appreciate from the numbers that a lot of statements have been said. I mean, for those of us who like numbers, you can piece numbers together and generate interpretations. And from the numbers of the 2016 elections, we have so much interpretation. Interpretation to the effect that the level of disaffection is high, the level of withdrawal from political participation was high. You could also tell that there was anger, there was frustration, there was disaffection. And I guess that these are very loud statements emanating from the numbers. It tells clearly that we have got into a very critical and crucial junction in the life of our party, that we need to re-strategize. We need to put in place a new set of vision that can accommodate the emerging trends 
and expectations of our people. That's where you come in. But and I guess that when it comes to understanding of the current internal dynamics within the party, the current dynamics within our country, the general expectations of the bulk of our membership, I believe I understand that better than anyone else. And I strongly believe that there's a need for the party to regenerate around a new set of ideas, a new set of policies, a new set of vision, a new set of relationships. And I guess that is where I come in. International uh, uh, policy analyst, uh, Dr. Ichi Tikankwa, I think he did a pro-cons analysis of you as a potential uh, presidential aspirant. For him, your temperament, your political experience and policy and professional expertise makes you well qualified. However, with the likes of um, Mahama, or former President Mahama, uh, with the likes of uh, uh, Spiel Gabra in the mix, uh, you know, you are like uh, the dark horse, you know, in the race. Uh, with a, what's it called, a, a long shot at here or candidate. Is that a clear reflection of, of your situation? Well, I don't know whether uh, being a dark horse or being described as a dark horse is derogatory. We saw what happened in France. Macron was described as a dark horse. I mean, relatively and significantly unknown. It happened in the U.S. and uh, that appears to be the trend the world over. And so when people refer to me as a dark horse, I take that as very complimentary. Mm. But I think that uh, the NDC has a lot of talents. Uh, no single individual can claim to be the repository of wisdom, and no single individual can claim to have it all. What is important is to assemble a good team and to be clearly focused on what matter. I guess that what is important is to repaint a picture of our desired future, taking into consideration what our individual and group expectations are, and weaving that into a policy and a governance arrangement that would satisfy the mass of our people. So that's that no matter how unrealistic, you know, the chances of winning an election, uh, you know, no individual would like to... Uh, going to an election uh, to lose or with a negative mind. But after a bit of self-reflection and interaction with members of your own party, how realistic again are your chances of winning? How unrealistic uh, 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 is my chance of winning? That is my question to you. Uh, I guess that the, 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 the delegates of our party have a responsibility of determining what is useful for a party. Mm. I've always trusted their views, I've always respected their views, and I think they've never been wrong. And they would... They delegate. Yeah, they've never mm. been wrong. Mm. And they won't be wrong this time. I see. And I guess that, uh, uh, God willing, uh, I'll be rhyming with their choice, and uh, I would emerge as the flag bearer of the... National Democratic Congress. That's very ironic. But your first attempt at the uh, NDC national position uh, was a disaster, I would say. In 2005, you contested uh, for the... I want to laugh. Uh, you contested for the general secretary position of your party. I can help you lost. I can help you laugh. I can help you laugh. But you lost, you know, you lost with a very uh, uh, small uh, uh, number. Uh, whilst as you doing Katia, let's go over. I think Johnson as you doing Katia pulled 1,060 votes. Uh, uh, the acting general secretary, Mr. Abede, uh, pulled 188 votes. Uh, Inchibu Siakon uh, had 103. What did Sylvester means? I get 64. So you trust, you just said that you trust the delegates. So do you trust them to repeat what happened again in 2005? Well, I think that in hindsight, I shouldn't have put myself up for that election for general secretary of the no, party. I would want to do that now. now. There's a much more higher position. Yeah, would you allow me? Would you? I'm listening. Yeah. I had been out of the country on studies for a while. I jumped in right after studies and quickly plunged into an election mood at a time when minds had been formed. I guess that my absence for school did not help out at all. Besides, 
uh, it was quite obvious in my engagements before filing that most party members had made up their minds. And uh, that's, that is why I say that in hindsight, it was not an election I should have contested. And uh, General Mosquito Senikete has been my very, very good friend. You sit back, you analyze the commencement of campaign, you analyze what went on during campaign, and you realize that it was not an election you should have ventured into. In but you, you did anyway. You did anyway. But, but do you also believe, uh, uh, Sylvester, your chances of winning would um, you know, improve tremendously if former President Mahama decide not to contest? Well, I think that the issue is not about former President Mahama. What's the issue? The issue is about the NDC. The issue is about how do we reform our party? How do we, as it were, review some of the systems that appear dysfunctional? It is about how do we reposition the party into another election with the defeat we suffered in 2016. It's about what understanding do we get from this defeat and reposition ourselves into the future. After positioning yourself, like getting all the systems right, if your names are not in the minds of people, I mean, how would they vote for you? President Mahama or former President Mahama is I would say the most popular uh, uh, person in, in, in NDC now. We've mentioned uh, Mahama. Everybody can associate themselves with you again. If he decides not to contest, would you be excited and, and you know feel that this is good? This is good news for me. Well, I don't want us to reduce the discussion to personalities. But let me also add that none of the hopefuls mm -hmm. has been a vice president. None has been a president. And so wanting to compare hopefuls with a former uh, leader of the country. It's like comparing mangoes and oranges. It is extremely difficult to, to assess potential. And in this particular instance, what there is to assess is potential. And I guess what measuring instrument they are going to use. But of course, we haven't begun the campaign. We haven't begun really going out there putting out our manifesto, our vision, telling our party members what our thoughts are for the party and what our thoughts are for Ghana in general. We haven't gotten there yet. I guess when we get there, people would then begin to measure potential and but not about experiences. You know, experiences don't necessarily connote competence, capacity, and performance. Uh, but appears. That is what most people would want to look at. In any case, uh, the campaign has not begun. And when the campaign begins, we would be able to tell the people why they shouldn't vote for you, Akosia Kunedu, and why they should vote for me, Sylvester Mensa. And yeah, that is I'm, where I'm the sure dynamics, that is, where, that is where the dynamics, who knows, you may be uh, considering. But, but I'm sure if, if, if I'm contesting, I'll, I'll beat you. Well, yeah. well, I'm sure you step down for me. <laughs> oh, yes, but, but really, how do you again, how do you again intend uh, to market yourself, uh, you know, properly ahead of 2018 Congress to achieve the, uh, the appreciable uh, following required to secure a win? Yeah, I'm not sure it's something I want to share in public, but I can assure you that... Why not? Have, Delegates are listening. Well, can, I can assure you that we are in the process. The party is yet to clearly define a timetable, and uh, campaign activity is yet to uh, formally begin. We are in the process of consultation. We are consulting widely. We are consulting at the grassroots, at the constituency level, at the regional level, among elders of the party, among national executives of the party. It is a broad and wide consultation process, and that is what we are engaged in now. Yes. At the appropriate time, we would plunge into discussing our vision and what we represent and what the party would be contending with with our candidature. And I guess when we get there... Uh, so that's like if election was to be held today, with all the names, your uh, former President Mahama, yourself, Babin, 
Commander uh, uh, what 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 position would you would you come out? We haven't set the stage. No, I'm we, haven't, we haven't. We haven't. We uh, haven't begun. A full scale campaign. We don't even know who the candidates no. are. So, uh, no I mean, candidate, no candidate has filed for a me, nomination. Exactly. The party so has with the no names vetted, that with the, the names party, that we've the we, party we are has hearing no vetted the candidates. With the name Sylvester that we I mean on the media every day we hear people Sylvester would emerge. Sylvester will win the election. Sylvester is the only name that would emerge after our primaries. We'll be right back. Welcome back. You are still watching The Hard Truth, and we are proudly brought to you by Murphy Homes and our industrial city. Uh, Mr. Sylvester Mensa is here, former MP for La Dadikotopon constituency, and uh, he's also the former chief executive officer of uh, National Health Insurance Authority. Sylvester, it appears, you know, you have to work extra hard at increasing your name recognition, and this translates into more resources and campaign spending do you have such resources and if not how do you plan on getting them of course i don't have such resources and indeed no one can fund his own campaign it takes people who believe in your vision it takes people who have trust and confidence in your leadership to provide that support and I guess I have that in abundance. And uh, the number of oh, people Oh, so do you have people approaching you saying that, oh, we, we see something in you and take this $100,000, take this well, I'm yet to 10 receive, million I'm, ye I'm yet to receive $10 million from you. Oh, my goodness. But of goodness. course, I have a lot of people who have shown interest in mm. my uh, campaign and my leadership. They think that uh, putting money in my campaign will not be wasteful. And uh, I Look, guess. So, can I ask how much you've gotten so far? Can you? Um, I'm sorry, I don't know how much I have for now because my activities and uh, consultations are funded. Anywhere I go, Who it's funded. Who funds it? I mean, the individuals, mm. individuals and friends. And you can't tell us who these individuals are. Uh, well, until you bring your support and contribution. I can't add you to the list. So let's do that. And then when I Until can, when you I, promise when, when I can me, add you to the list. Until you I promise would, me that when you win, actually win the flag bearer position and actually take Ghana on as a president and you'll be the first interview on the heart that I'll put some money in. Is, is, that, <laughs> is that right? That's assured. <laughs> <laughs> but again, in October 2017, you... Uh, supposedly uh, released a social media post uh, of effort to gather support uh, for from the grassroots. And then the slogan he used was, uh, you know, cause some stir on social media. Um, it says that, no uh, edidija. Guys, no edidija your slogan. No, no edidija is not my slogan. I guess a number of uh, posters of mine appeared uh, on social media that I had no idea about. Mm. Uh, there were a few I had to look out for the originators and get them to withdraw. There have been a few I've asked the originators to, to review and a host of others. It is part of the euphoria, it's part of the, the enthusiasm surrounding the emergence of my name and several people without being contracted in any way are showing interest and this is the way they think they must show their interest. I guess that slogan uh, 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 came out of uh, such enthusiasm. And uh, I tried to, it was difficult to locate the source, but with a few statements. So that didn't come with, from you at all, you're from your from, camp at yeah, all? Yeah, no. I had, what came from my camp was, a, not from my camp, but from, from a group of people who, of course, showed to me uh, rewarding loyalty and a host of others. And then whilst that was out there, someone also inserted uh, uh, no Dija there, uh, supposedly uh, an account interpretation of rewarding loyalty. Mm. But of course, uh, it was a little harsh and uh, I, I, I tried to get them to back down on that. One argument against your candidature uh, by some people is the failed 
uh, or you fail to, to bring any significant uh, improvement to the NHIA. Hence, you know, it will be very difficult for Ghanaians to fully put their confidence and trust in you to deliver as president. How confident, again, Sly, are you um, that your national health insurance history will not negatively affect uh, your chances of winning the election? I guess I have a very positive history from the National Health Insurance Authority. Mm. I mean, except for those who don't, are not aware of the state of the health insurance scheme at the time we took over in 2009. I guess what you see today as the edifice, the structure, the form of the scheme, that is the infrastructure, was part of my initiative and uh, the current strategies and systems in operation you see today are all, I mean, part of the uh, uh, innovations that I have introduced. The instant ID card issuance, uh, pattern from the existing uh, cards production that takes six to one year to deliver was also an innovation. The whole concept of clinical audit, claims processing, and uh, uh, call centers, and a host of others, against which several awards uh, have received, both locally and internationally. So, that's if you did I, so well, I, I guess I, I guess that uh, an agency like Imani, mm. which is a very critic of the NDC. Uh, uh, give me an award as the best chief executive in 2014 and the health insurance as the leading public service institution. I had also received several local and international awards aside this and uh, I had become a global resource person when it comes to health insurance. You are aware how several countries from America, from the U.S., I mean, from the from the U.S., from Europe, from Africa, have all come over to Ghana, from Asia, all over, to learn from the innovations that we had introduced. But why would the president uh, withdraw you uh, from and so, and some after, place you you have so, talked about receiving awards and and getting all this international recognition? Why wouldn't he actually empower you to do more and expand the authority? I mean, I'm sure you know where to put that question. But what is important is that the president thought otherwise, and he thought that my services would be better placed in his office. What, what and of did course, you do at the, the flag at the, staff? At the president's, mm. the president's is the highest public office, and that is where I was reassigned. Doing what? I was doing so many things. I, I was see. I was doing so many things at the Flagstaff. I house. see, but but speaking on uh, on the Super Morning Show, I think somewhere in 2011, you said the idea of um, a one-time premium is a social contract that uh, the government had, uh, you know, with the people of this country. Uh, it was one of the uh, the key pillars that end the National Democratic Congress, you know, the, the mandate uh, of the people, you know, to this country. And, uh, you know, you obviously failed at it, didn't you? The issue of failure doesn't come in here. One time premium belongs to history. I'm wondering why you are recalling uh, uh, people no, from, but, but, from but the grave. If you said you would do discuss. that, in any case, you would do in any that. Case, in you any didn't case. do it. So why should in, I, as a citizen, trust in any that case. when you get on that, uh, that campaign platform and promise me good roads, I'm like, okay, he has a history. Uh, he said was going to do that at one time, and he did it. So I can actually put my confidence in Sylvester Mensah and actually vote for you. The one-time premium was a manifesto promise. Mm. Of course, as you rightly said, a social contract. There we were in government. And uh, the very people for whom one-time premium was targeted had raised objections and have indicated that would not really serve their purpose. Government then decided to undertake uh, a stakeholder engagement to determine whether to pursue its objective, its manifesto promise. The stakeholder engagement came to a consensus that one-time premium must be put aside. Government, being a listening one, decided on the basis of the stakeholders, I mean, position to put it aside 
to just do as they had suggested. And this, I think, must be commended because government listened to the Ghanaian people, listened to stakeholders, and in that stakeholder forum, it was not only local locals who were participating, but a number of international experts were all brought in. And at the end of the day, the general consensus was that one-time premium should be set aside. The president himself, President Mahama, was at the closing ceremony of the, the stakeholder engagement where the final document or proposal to put aside one-time premium was handed over to him mm. on the basis of that health insurance had instructions to put it aside. You can't call that failure. This is a government that has put across to the public, to the people of this country, an idea. The people of this country have gone back to say that, no, for A and B reason, kindly let this be on the back burner. And government responds to the voice of the people. I Isn't see. that commendable? I see, but, but Sly, the NHIS is, you know, an intervention that is a very, or is very dear to the Ghanaian people. And there were various inefficiencies under the scheme that attracted many um, criticisms uh, from the public domain. As the boss of the NHIA at that time, whether fair to you or not, you know, the bar stopped uh, with you. Even though you were cleared by Yoko on the suspicions of, I think, false claim payment, the BNI investigations, you know, also in, uh, instigated uh, the government or the image that was tented on, on you by the public. You know, don't you think the Ghanaian people will find it very difficult to regain that trust because we've created an image of you already? Well, I think that when you find yourself in public office, managing public purse, the mm -hmm. taxpayer's money, you must also appreciate that you've also accepted the responsibility of submitting yourself to investigations. There is nothing wrong investigating a public officer. What is critical is propriety in public office. And I guess that is key. If you are being investigated, it doesn't make you a bad person or a criminal. If there's shooting outside and the police decides to quickly rush in and arrest all those they find out there on suspicion of, uh, of, of shooting or killing for that matter, uh, the fact that you have been held at the police station for three days whilst investigations continue and get released a week after, that don't make you a criminal. The police has a responsibility to ensure that they rake the entire area and identify who the culprits are. So it is. But the worth. police won't come arresting after investigating. They will have to investigate and make sure that this person I'm going in for, you know, is really a suspect. Yeah, the police also make mistakes. We are humans. We all make mistakes. So let me simply say that, yes, I went through an investigation, and uh, I'm glad to say that I'm one of the, I'm perhaps the only seven appointee mm -hmm. of the past regime mm -hmm. who went through a public investigations and came out clean with no adverse finding. And I guess that is positive. I see. But let's look at again your experience uh, with BNI. You quote that, or you have quoted and you said, that your deal with the BNI was an extremely uh, painful experience. Do you, or did you feel targeted and do you hold uh, uh, former President Mahama, uh, you know, responsible or do you have anything against him? I don't think so. You know, the presidency is a very hot seat mm. and uh, the presidency receives all kinds of information. The president as an individual has only two eyes and can only see that far. Mm -hmm. So if there are complaints, there are suspicions, all he has to do to clear his mind is to investigate. And so he does so. What is and there's no malice. I see. And when that is done, what is important is to say that yes, the was malfeasance 
or no, no malfeasance. I guess that if you're a public officer and you are investigated, your pride should be that there has been no adverse finding. And that is how I feel. A clean bill of health. No other public officer had gone through that process. I have. And I feel very happy and proud about that. And that, that won't come back hunting you in future? No. In what way? I was never charged. It was an investigation. The investigations never came out with any charges. And at the end of the day, it concluded that there has been no adverse finding. Why should you break bones about that? You must be happy. I don't know why you want to think that I mean, I'm, exci I I'm excited be, for you. I should be unhappy. No, no I'm, I'm excited I'm ex for you. I'm exceedingly grateful and happy. I see. And I thank my God for that. Mm. Very few people go through such experiences and uh, come out unscratched. Are you happy with the efforts within your, your party or the unity efforts within your party? There's a unity work, uh, trying to get the grassroots together. I'm asking if, if you're happy about it. Well, I guess, I guess, I guess, if you want to talk about unity work, um, you know, it's like putting the cart before the horse. Uh, unity work for the NDC at this time, I guess, is intellectually bankrupt. I guess it's politically divisive. I am not sure it is useful. Because if you want to really understand unity, Unity doesn't happen in a vacuum. Unity occurs around issues, around individuals' personalities, around policies, manifestos, and within the context of a political party. Mm. We are talking about unity around a leader. We are talking about unity around the election of all the levels of executives of our party, unity around our manifesto, and unity towards an election. Unity doesn't happen in a vacuum. We find ourselves in a situation where we are undertaking reorganization. Reorganization entails elections. Elections entail competition. And so at the end of the day, we're going to have winners and losers. Mm. We're going to have some happy, some angry. We're going to have opponents. We're going to have adversaries. And then from there, we're going to have our I mean, leadership uh, primaries for selecting the flag bearer of our party. I mean, they're going to be winners and losers. And it is after all this that the party would now have to shape up and reposition into an election. And that is the time that the party can rightly be talking about unity, and that is the right time the party can be talking about work as but just a little component mm. of the solution to the broader challenge of internal unity. Anything work today perhaps has to do a lot more with health. I mean, the health benefits of work, but I'm but not, not sure. Unified. I'm not sure. So is it a it's, waste it's, of time? Do you think it's a waste of time because you see numbers before? Well, I guess, know, I guess, I guess, I mean, to put it bluntly, it is just a smoke screen for an individual to position himself for, but, and who is this for, individual? For, 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 I don't know, to, for an individual no, to position, for an individual to position himself for leadership. And I guess that it is, it is unfair. But who is you smoking find, this? You find, you find the use of a, a party walk. When you talk of a party walk, mm. you want to see a party unity walk. You want to see unity, the form and content of unity. You want to see the national executives at the walk. You want to see various blocks and individual leaders uh, in the work. You want to see various aspirants or uh, hopefuls in the work, and that is unity. But in a situation where you have a section of people mm. and you have uh, a supposed uh, a hopeful or aspirant who has not declared yet leading a unity work as a prelude to eventual uh, uh, Are you uh, talking about guess, former President uh, Mahama? Of course. You are referring to him. I guess, I guess, I guess it is not helpful, it mm. is not useful. The work is not helpful, it is not useful. No. Do you think that former President Rawlings is, you know, is playing his part, you know, well enough in the efforts, the unity efforts? If there is any, from what you just said. 
You may have a basis for asking. Perhaps you want to expand further so I know where you're coming from. No, because so there is a general... This is, this is a very broad question and yes, I don't know where to but start. But there is a general... Uh, uh, we all know that the NDC uh, embarks on these works in the name of unifying the, the party, the grassroots, the leaders and all of them. I'm asking if you think uh, former President Rawlings is really playing any part in the effort. We must appreciate that President Rawlings is a founder of our party. And that is enshrined in our constitution. Besides, we must also appreciate that he represents the spirit and soul of our party. He is the embodiment of our values probity, accountability, transparency, and social justice. Our party was constructed on the values that he cherished and lived by. And so you cannot talk about the NDC and discount President Rollins. And I guess that there's, it is important for us as a party to, to to show some regard for, for those who have come before us and for us to also at least appreciate and uh, uh, the, the, the silver lining on the clouds that we see. We shouldn't see things as either black or white. Mm. There's something there in between. And I guess that is what we appear to be missing as a party. What is that? I guess Which that... Is? I guess, I guess that President Rollins is an integral part of the party. I guess that he has a significant role to play in our party. I believe that the party needs to, to, needs to give him uh, 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 the space to operate, and uh, particularly at this time that we find ourselves in, in opposition, he has a significant role, role to play, and I have a lot of respect for him. We'll be right back. Welcome back. You are still watching The Hard Truth and we are proudly brought to you by Murphy Homes and Dawa Industrial City, former Chief Executive Officer of uh, National Health Insurance Authority and uh, former MP for La Dadikotopong constituency, Mr. Sylvester Mensa is still here. Sylvester, mm, let me ask you bluntly, are you happy with the relationship between uh, former President Mahama and uh, Rollins, former President Rollins? Well, unless, unless you know something that I don't know. Because <laughs> no, because I, we I, see I, on I'm, TV, um, they were shaking hands, and, you know, you can see the body yeah, language wasn't quite fair-fetched. I don't get where mm. you're coming from. I guess that, and that argument, that discussion, that conversation mm. is entirely misplaced, completely misplaced. Why is that? President Rollins hardly hugs in public. Can you count the number of times you have seen President Rawlings hugging in public? He hardly does so. He comes to public very serious and very focused. And mind you, he's an ex-serviceman, and he acts military, he speaks military. And I watch the videos of uh, some of his uh, public engagements. Mm. That is the way he greets. No, that is the way he the heart, I think that it is, it, is, it is unfair. Body language and it is, it welcoming it is, it is, mood. It is of. unfair to judge the way President Kufuo greets mm. as a basis for defining and judging the way President Rawlings greets. Mm. These are two significantly different individuals. And I guess that we need to see it as that. But, President but Rawlings it, greeted everyone and from when he started greeting till he ended, mm. he was consistent. Mm -hmm. He did not change it for any other person. He was focused, military-like, as he has always been, greeted and sat down. I think this argument, no is, this, uh, this argument is misplaced, completely I, misplaced. I see. But, but you believe that uh, former President Rawlings is an integral part of the success of the NDC. In fact, you are of the view that he's a spirit behind your party 
the embodiment of uh, values, uh, you know, and principles of the party. Can the NDC, uh, you know, exist without your John Rawlings? Of course, political parties are supposed to outlive the life of their founders. Political parties are supposed to be immortalized. If you have a political party that cannot live beyond the life of the founder, then I'm afraid you don't have a political party. The NDC has proved that it has the capacity to live beyond the life of the founder. And that is why occasionally the party disagrees with the founder. The fact that individuals disagree with the founder does not change the fact that he is the founder. The fact that the founder disagrees occasionally with the party, with significant individuals in the party, does not in any way change the NDC as a political party. Mr. Vesa, do you think that Mr. Rawlings is, I would say, losing influence within your party, comparing the influence with uh, your party, within your party, uh, founder had, you know, in the, in the past years prior to Mills and perhaps President Mohammed's presidency, to the influence he has now, would you say that it is dropping or it has dropped? Uh, of course, it has to drop. I mean, uh, leadership is, is, is situational. And it, and it emerges. Every epoch and what defines the euphoria mm. surrounding the preferred leader. And I guess you don't expect that generation after generation, an individual will wield the same influence as he wielded in years past. I don't think uh, uh, it's consistent with social science. I guess that it is expected that one's influence would win with time. It is expected that as we grow into generations, the coming generation may not have the same feel as the previous one, and that affects our influence. But that does not in any way change the individual Rawlings for who he is and what he represents. In your personal estimation, is there a concerted effort uh, from some elements within uh, your party to sideline uh, from a person Rollins? I guess that you can't have everyone liking you as an individual. I mean, as I sit here today, I don't expect everybody to like me, even though uh, I would have loved that. But it doesn't happen. And so it is with anyone. There are some speculations that, you know, you are trying to court favor uh, from Mr. Rollins and seek his support uh, for your presidential ambitions. How true is this? And can I ask if you're a Rollins boy? Are you a Rollins boy? I don't know what that means. Um, I, I've, 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 I've never had a godfather. I have good relations with everyone, uh, non-aligned, mm. friends to all, enemy to none. And that has been my policy, that has been my philosophy. I. I, I, I don't see myself as anybody's boy, but at the same time, I have a lot of respect for the different shades of opinion we have in our party. And I guess that is how I have existed over the years, and that is how I have triumphed. Mr. Victor Smith believes that your founder has become uh, too close to President Akufuado. In his own words, you know, he said uh, they are now best friends and they go to every function together. And I want to, he said he's worried about that, uh, about their friendship, and, but he cannot say. Are you worried too? I think that is also a completely misplaced conversation. Mm. Uh, there must be a basis for worry. And uh, what should be the basis? What are the actions emanating from what you may want to consider an unholy relationship as a basis for worry. And uh, would you also consider such relationships as unholy? One expects some comradeship between and among current and former presidents. And uh, we need to see it within that light. Any attempt to, to see it beyond that may not be helpful for our democracy. How would you describe uh, your relationship with Mr. Martin Amidu, if there is any? Yeah, Mr. Martin Amidu is a senior comrade. 
He is a gentleman I respect so much. He is a man full of conviction, full of passion. We all know him as an anti-corruption uh, crusader, advocate, and champion. He has gone out of his way as an individual to even prosecute cases in court. He has earned the name Citizen Vigilante. And uh, I have a lot of respect for him, for his legal prowess. He's a legal luminary, and he's very passionate on anti-corruption issues. Do you consider Martin Amidu as a member of the NDC? I have no evidence that uh, Mr. Martin Amidu has resigned from the National Democratic Congress, mm. and to that extent, he remains a member of the NDC. Mm. Uh, I am aware that he has had brushes with uh, a number of individuals within the party, mm -hmm. but I guess that is normal and uh, 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 contradictions. Yeah, because according the, to the national organizer of your party, Mr. Kofi Adams, Martin Amidu does not consider himself as a member of, of the NDC, and I don't know if you are aware of this. I have not heard this, but I heard the general secretary say that Martin Amidu is a card-bearing member of the NDC, mm. and I believe our general secretary. The president has decided to present him to parliament for the approval, uh, you know, as much as awaited, you know, special law prosecutor. Do you approve of the president's decision? But let me first say that corruption is a global challenge. And uh, every country and every individual must enroll in the fight against corruption. My tolerance threshold for corruption is very low. And I support every strategy, every system to address the issue of corruption. Martin Amidu's name comes up at a time when Ghana has hyped the issue of corruption. As we sit today, we have parliament discussing issues of corruption or extortion. We have had several media uh, uh, trials on corruption in this country, both for or against NDC and the NPP. And I guess the time is just ripe mm. for such uh, a, a fight against corruption. I see Martin Amidu's nomination as, as, as an honor to him as an individual and uh, perhaps to this country. I, don't, I wouldn't say that his appointment is because he's considered a member of the NDC. I guess he's seen more as an independent mind. He's seen more as someone who has a capacity to live above partisan consideration and uh, someone who is fair and firm and someone who has the passion for eradicating corruption. But some, and some I guess, people, right. And I, and I guess I guess Ghana couldn't have had a better person than Martin, than Amidu. Martin Amidu. Some people uh, you know, believe that the president is playing a dangerous game. In Nusa Hussein, I like in the situation to hold in uh, you know, a tail of a lion. Do you see this as a case, or do you see it that way? Well, I mean, any anti-corruption crusader must be someone who is fearless mm. and uh, someone who does not kuto to group interests, someone who is fair and firm. And if by being perceived as firm and fair, people have to be scared, then so be it. But at the end of the day, if you have exercised propriety in public office, you have no reason to worry about who is special prosecutor. If you have not engaged in any willful act of causing financial loss to the state, you have no business being angry or worried about who has been appointed. I guess that we need to give Mr. our senior comrade Martin Amidu the chance to prove himself. I guess he has a reputation to protect. 
He has an ego to feed. I enroll in his humility in accepting the offer. And I also enroll in his pride as the first special prosecutor of Ghana. Finally, finally, Sylvester, is it likely for Martin Amidu to come after you? Are you clean? Of course, I'm clean. So he's not coming after you? I mean, why should he come after me? Thank you very much for talking so hard. <laughs> Thank you very much. Mr. Sylvester Mensa is the former chief executive officer of the National Health Insurance Authority, uh, former member of parliament for La Dadikotopon constituency. And I thank you so much for coming, sir. And you've been watching The Hard Truth. Now, what do you make of Sylvester's uh, intention to lead uh, the NDC in the coming elections? Uh, leave your comments on our social media screens, on your platforms on your screens right now. You've been watching The Hard Truth. Catch a repeat of the program tomorrow. It's at 9 a.m. to 10 a.m. My name is Nana Akusia Knedu Asante Samuels, and we are proudly brought to you by Murphy Homes and Dawa Industrial City. Thank you so much. Good night.